Hi. So uh, my name is Emmanuel Papirakis. I'm a senior engineer for AWS CloudFront, and today we're going to discuss enhancing uh, connection durability over any cast. So uh, overview of the, the talk is going to go like this. Quick introduction. Then we're going to discuss about uh, unicast CDN routing, anycast CDN routing, and then what problems are introduced by anycast routing and uh, potential solutions to anycast and uh, some takeaways. So. Why does this thing uh, matter? Well, the reason why it matters is because, you know, we might not always realize it, but when we're streaming video, whatever decisions are taken at the transport level, they affect uh, different uh, aspects of the user experience, uh, mainly rebuffering and uh, timeliness of uh, live uh, uh, streams. So, if you, you want to have like a 30 second uh, overview of uh, what to think about when you think about transport, this is a really good uh, analogy. So imagine this, you've got like a Y uh, dimension, right, which is the bandwidth, and the X axis is uh, the, the time. So usually what ends up happening is your, your stream goes through some kind of a bottleneck, and when it does go through some kind of a bottleneck, it spreads in time uh, from bandwidth, and you end up having a temporal space between the packets when it goes back to the bigger network, right? And then the receiver receives the packets, then acknowledges them, and then the temporal spacing is re retained. Then on the sender side, if you're able to figure out how many packets need to be out, you just send a new packet every time an old packet is acknowledged, and then the sort of works out using the ax as the clock. Now, the thing to keep in mind is this system is, works very well, except there's a bit of fragility to it. And some of that fragility comes, for example, on the receiver path, right? There could be some congestions and things like that that skew the temporal spacing of the ax. So what you do is you send a little bit more, right? So the little bit more goes in some kind of a queue somewhere, right? And then that uh, compensates for the buffer. So you need input buffers, and you also need uh, some buffering somewhere in the network, right? And then the question is, what happens if a packet is lost? Well, TCP guarantees a few things. One of them is uh, no duplication of uh, traffic, but also in-order delivery. So if, you retrans if TCP retransmits on your behalf, when you receive the packet, right, the client won't be able to read the packets that it received up until the point where this packet was received because of the in-order delivery guarantee. So uh, this is an important thing to keep in mind. Well, so if we take a look at the uh, generalized uh, CDN routing, uh, we don't see the world map very well, but the thing here is uh, this is a, a popular CDN, right? And this popular CDN, we see there's different points of presence. We call them POPs, right? And uh, those POPs uh, need to, to uh, receive traffic. So how do you decide which POPs uh, gets uh, what's traffic? Right? Uh, there's a few uh, strategies for it, but there's also uh, s some caveats. Like in some regions, there's, uh, it's easier to build POPs than in other regions. So uh, sometimes there's uh, regions with uh, lots of capacity and regions with less capacity. But another thing that uh, is, is very common is si similar to the, the highway network, right? Uh, there's always going to be maintenance, upgrades, and accidents. If you have something that's uh, glo global spanning, if, if uh, you know you, you, you want to, the network to be very stable, it, it's something that is difficult to obtain because there's always something that, that's old that needs to be upgraded. There's always something that's under maintenance and all that. So when you do the routing, it's very important that uh, you take that into account because not all the network links are 100% available all the time. In fact, you, it's almost guaranteed that somewhere there's something that uh, is not available right now. So now let's talk about uh, unicast routing as a strategy. So uh, in case you're not familiar uh, with it, so there's two layers of routing. One of them is uh, done at the DNS level, and another one is done at the IP level, and today we'll focus on the DNS level routing. So uh, what's going on is you've got a client that uh, is trying to get to a, a video stream or distribution. Then it'll send a DNS request, and then the, the DNS request will have the IP address of one of the POPs. Now, in this uh, situation, all the POPs, they have different IP addresses, and the association between client and CDN resource is durable because of that fact. So the way we orchestrate uh, you know, traffic is by using some data cookers that we have in the cloud. 
So those data cookers, they take streams of data, like latency and network utilization, capacity and all that, and then they cook it into nice data structures that are easily usable by DNS servers. So when you get a request, you quickly find the best possible puff for the uh, customer, right? And because it's a unique IP, then uh, the association is durable. Uh, a key point here is this. This is everybody's familiar with uh, IP header. There's source address, destination address. So semantically, there's a, a, these things associate the, the client and they associate the server. Right. With the unicast, right, you, you get clearly orchestrated, um, you know, uh, routing and uh, capacity association, right? And uh, with unicast, it's important to, uh, with, with unicast, the destination IP always refers to a CDN resource, not to a, a particular piece of content. So now let's talk about anycast routing. So with anycast routing, the idea is this. Uh, you've got uh, one IP address that's shared across all the different pops, right? So it can be more than one, but that's the main idea. So you're sending one packet to a specific IP address, and then you let the IP layer decide which is the best possible pop for you. Right? Uh, it's kind of like, um, if you look at this one, you can view the internet as uh, this or orchestrated graph, right? And then routers at the highest possible level is what they're trying to do when they, they're sending a packet to a destination, uh, they're going to do breadth first search. And the first thing that they find is where the packet needs to go, and then they, just, they, they, they get to routes that way. With Anycast, you introduce multiple solutions into the graph, and then means if you have a customer that's in Australia, then he'll be routed to the closest pop, probably in Australia. In the United States, going to be routed somewhere in the United States. Now, there's some disadvantages and problems that come with the idea of Anycast. So this is the biggest one. So there's maintenance, upgrades, and accidents. When there's some changes in the network, for example, maybe the best possible location for a customer is A, right? But A is not available right now. And then the customer goes to the second best location, which is B. When A comes online, then all the traffic goes from B to A. And then this might cause problems. But, so if you take a look, uh, historically, if you've played with computers uh, a very long time ago, computers used to boot very fast, but network used to be very slow, right? So if you look at the, uh, the original RFC for TCP, there's a, uh, a section in there that says, what happens if a TCPA crash and reboots very fast while there's still ongoing uh, TCP uh, connections? So in this case, the standard says you send a reset basically telling the other side, I have no idea what, what this connection is, right? You need to abort, but it, it'll do that by saying, this is my IP address, but I don't know about the connection. So uh, this can come and, and bite us uh, in the Anycast world because we're sending packets, and then when the routes change, they go to the incorrect location. So in this specific example, um, uh, there's a idea of consistent hashing to solve the ownership problem, but it's not perfect because if you have a, a host that's out, right, uh, your client might be connection, uh, connected to a different host, and when it comes back in, it takes ownership, sends a reset, severs the connection. Now, if you go back to one of the previous slides, when uh, the connection is severed, the packets that are in flight, they still uh, have the IP address of the client, so they'll go there. So for a period of time, your client is going to download two streams. So the real problem with Anycast, so Anycast is not completely evil, but it has those caveats. One of them is it breaks the end-to-end -end principle. So the internet was designed with this idea of there's a source IP, a destination IP, and IPs uniquely identify machines, right? But uh, you know, we broke it in many different ways, Anycast being one of them, but um, the, the internet is not completely robust to, to those things because we're breaking some of the assumptions that were made when it was designed. So uh, the information in the destination IP that was intended to be there is now lost. So and it, it's really hard to solve at scale. So do we have solutions? Of course we have solutions. So there's three main categories of solutions for that. The first category of solution is we try to do a computation. We're looking at the packet, we do a computation, and we try to consistently push the connection to uh, a consistent host. A second one is uh, you can try to centralize uh, ownership and um, you know, 
store the data somewhere else, or finally, you can encode it inside the packet itself. The problem with the last one is the, the packet has uh, you know, fields that are already in use, and you end up doing things like, well, why don't we put this in the timestamp? Why don't we put this in the sequence number? And there's some uh, you know, issues. But, so when I don't know what to do, sometimes I ask myself, what would this guy do, Wayne Gretzky? But, and then this is the thing that uh, he likes to say. He says, hockey players, the great ones, they go where the puck is going to go, not where the puck is. So where is the puck going? Uh, some people will tell you uh, quick is, is uh, uh, where the puck is going from the transport protocol level. So quick is the quick UDP internet uh, connection, right? So there's some new ideas in QUIC, but the, one of the biggest benefits is TCP IP grew well beyond its, intent, its envisioned scope, right? And uh, QUIC is there to um, fill in some of the gaps uh, you know, that uh, TCP no longer uh, satisfies. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is QUIC being uh, in its early uh, adoption uh, version, right? It is not yet its best self, which means uh, implementations are, are a little bit imperfect. Right, and uh, the internet is not necessarily ready for them, and there's some features in Quick you know, that uh, uh, are, are not yet at their best possible self. Uh, and it'll evolve over time, and it'll become better. So uh, just uh, two features of Quick uh, that are very beneficial are th this first one, where when you look at TCP, right, if you want to do a connection, you need three-way handshake, and that requires some round trips, requires some delay. Then you want TLS on top of that, then that means that there's also additional delays because there are yet an additional handshakes. With QUIC, there's a zero RTT feature that can be used, right, where instead of having all those uh, round trips, you just have one. Say, I have a request, all the crypto material, the handshake material, everything is there along with the request. Same with the response. This is fully authenticated, you know, fully encrypted, and it's very nice. So another feature, which is the, the main uh, feature that I like the most, is in, in the unencrypted header, right, uh, Quick has an unencrypted portion. So uh, servers are allowed to put some uh, connection ID information up to 20 bytes, which those 20 bytes can be used by router and different pieces of equipment in order to route uh, in, in a stable way. And uh, one of the ways that this feature can be used is this. So imagine you're, you're watching a live, uh, video streaming on your Wi-Fi using an IP address that comes from your, uh, your own router, right? And then in this case, the router is doing hash-based load balancing. So with the hash-based load balancing, the connection packets might land on one cache host, right? Then when you switch to cellular, you change your source IP address. Then the hash on your connection changes. Then it goes to connection uh, to a different cache host. But because of the connection ID, one thing we can do now is this. Uh, within the connection ID, we uh, can uh, decide that the, the content will actually go to a different cache host, and we can tun tunnel it there using uh, technologies such as uh, XDP and so on. And then uh, this is what happens. Uh, we, we can solve the problem in that way. So here are some takeaways. When looking at, uh, should I use unicast, should I use uh, anycast, right? If you're going to use TCP workloads and you have a choice between anycast and unicast, there's a strong possibility that unicast is actually the more robust way for you to go because the, there's a guaranteed uh, stability in the association between server resource and uh, client resource, right? So if, if you are going to use TCP and anycast, you know, it's okay, except be prepared for occasional reset packets, right, which will sever the connection. You need to be robust, and you need to retry. And this can lead to uh, potential, potential rebuffering. Uh, long term, uh, I, we should consider uh, moving uh, more uh, content to quick and uh, leverage uh, the new functionality that's available in that protocol. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.